Martins and welcome to What's Wrong With Wolfie. My name is Jason. And I'm Rich. And I'm Chris. And we've hit the TV shows of 1997. So, was 1997 in TV as spectacular as in the movie world? The short answer for me is no. When looking back through the TV shows of this year, for me, nothing jumped out at all, which is why my pick this time is a show that started life a few years before 97, but was still going strong in this year. But that, that is my just my, my opinion. And there were some decent shows that debuted, including Stargate, SG-1 and Brass Eye, which are our other shows that we're chatting about this week. But before we start, 97 included the end of our, well, me and Rich's beloved Games Master, with the last episode airing on the 21st of March. God. I think it went out on a high. Do you agree, Rich? Yeah, I mean, I found that episode, I've, I think I've got a record of saying it before, but I found that episode quite emotional. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still remember it vividly, the, you know, Dom's final sign-off. I think I actually told him when he, we had him on. Remember that episode? Um, <laughs> we, we never talk about it much, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I just thought it was quite an affecting episode. And it was kind of just like a clip show, wasn't it, really? It mm. never really did, you know, it wasn't a normal format. Mm. And just him at the end was just, oh, yeah, you can see in, um, Patrick Moore getting into the back of the taxi. I was just like, it, little, the little things it did, it just, it did feel final. And obviously, yeah. We know it kind of came back for a reboot, but yeah, we knew that time was done. It wasn't yeah. going to come back three years later, you know, because there was a demand for it. It was just, yeah, it was a lovely little send off. And it's a show that was very key in my uh, my love for gaming. Yeah. And like it was, um, you know, obviously Series 7 was the series that should never have been because it was, you know, it was cancelled for ser after Series 6, but, you know, they forgot to do so. And, uh, <laughs> You know, they had the chance to do Amazing. one last swan song of a series. And, you know, I think Dom grab, grabbed it by both hands and just went for it for that last series. And you can tell. But, you know, like I think when, when we originally covered Games Master in our 92 episode, I think I remember saying, like, when I rewatched the first episode, Dom looked a bit, you know, pissed off, like he didn't really want to be there. But after rewatching it again recently, I, you know, I take that back, you know, because I think he was... Um, I think he was just like just going for it because this was something that was never meant to be. He he was never meant mm -hmm. to have this opportunity to do one one last Games Master. So I guess with everything that Games Master was to him or is to him, um, he won. He had you know, and he realised he had this chance to take Games Master and end it on a high instead of just um, as a normal TV show. And he 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 did just ran with it. And the crew, and it was marvellous. Yeah, that was indeed. I mean, I think, i trying to remember now, it's kind of really following on from Games Master. I was never really anyone that watched, you know, um, shows around the same time, like Gamers World or anything. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously this kind of paved the way for the shows that followed. You know, we got mm. your Bits and your Thumb Bandits, especially Bits yeah. for me. That was, what, right, late 90s. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I absolutely adore that show. In many ways, they're still, in a way, kind of have more fondness for it than Games Master. It maybe got me at a certain time in my life. I was a little bit older and I was more into the weird. Obviously, yeah, we know that Games Master has a weird sense of humour, but mm -hmm. there was something a bit more obscure and surrealist with them. Bits yeah. I really appreciated, and I feel like yeah, those shows probably owe something to what came before them. Um, but yeah, Games Master's such a key show for me growing up. So. Mm -hmm. Seeing it say goodbye was very sad. Yeah, but um, you know we have we have Dom's Dom back in his um, purple little column on his Substack now, and uh, it's really cool to just to hear him back um, yeah. every week with with his gaming thoughts and insights, and kind of to feel like um, a little games master's back in some some little way, and it's just yeah. lovely. So if anyone's yeah. listening that hasn't checked that out, then you should do so by um, just finding him on Twitter at Dominic Diamond, and I'm sure you can find the links in his profile somewhere or another. But um, I asked on our Discord um, if the guys had any other memories of the TV of 97. They did come back with a few comments, and Chrissy too did say, said that he didn't watch much TV in 97, but what he does remember watching was those American teen comedies like Hang Time, City <laughs> Guys, Sister Sister, The Steve Harvey Show, you know. <laughs> Sweet, Sweet Valley High, USA High, 
Um, you know, some were released before '97, but they kind of ran through that year too. But uh, any 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 shows he mentions there that you're fond of, Rich or Chris? Not particularly. I knew of their existence because obviously you turn the TV on on a morning or when you get in from school or whatever. But I never really watched them as such. Hang time, maybe out of all of them, I think I remember mostly. Mm-hmm. But it's pretty vague after yeah. that. Yeah, I I can't remember watching any of the no. shows that uh, Chrissy uh, mentioned. Fortunately, sorry, mate. Well, I think but... like it's it's one of those like, 1997, so I was 13, nearly 14. So yeah, I was kind of getting out of that target audience, I suppose, maybe. Mm-hmm. Sure. And also uh, not having satellite TV as well. I can only yeah. tune into what happened to be on BBC or or CT, CITV at whatever time, you know. Sure. Okay, um, and Matty Boo said that he had a slightly different experience because he had um, S4C in Wales, so all the Channel 4 <laughs> content had a bit of a shuffle in the uh, schedule. The joys of going on holiday when you used to look at what the original variants of ITV were. They were always best. Like, <laughs> yeah. well, the local news looks different. <laughs> it's yeah. like it's a different studio. It's exciting. The weather's but, got a slightly different weather map. Somehow Ooh. Fred Darmage is in all of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't. When we when I first came down here with Nick, like, to visit family, I hadn't been to Isle of Wight for... F- when last time I came down was, what, 1996? So when we're sitting around our mums and they've got, like, uh, what's it, 6 o'clock news or 10 o'clock news or whatever, I'm like, who is that? Is that is that Fred Dynage on BBC? Is it BBC South he does? He used to be Meridian, didn't he? Is it Meridian? It might be Good Meridian. South East ITV, yeah. And I sat there, I was like, what's he doing reading the news? <laughs> like, <laughs> he should be a like kids presenter, entertainer. That, that kind yeah. of thing. It, was, it completely blew my mind that <laughs> he was on Hampshire yeah, crazy, TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, sorry, a bit of content... Uh, on Matty Boo's comment, because I said beforehand that uh, Land of the Giants was a central Sunday wow. Sunday morning viewer on oh, Channel God, 4. Oh, God, I haven't seen years. Um, <laughs> and that's why he was saying he had a slightly different experience in Wales. Uh, there was a bit of a shuffle. On a Sunday morning for, for Matty, he, he had Babylon 5 around 10, 11 a.m., but then he believes the slot was also taken up by Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and wow. the Avengers. Um, wow. Do you remember watching those kind of shows back then? Um, Land of the Giants, yes. Uh, not so much the others, no. Mm-hmm. But I've, I've, I have do have a great fondness of like the Sunday block on Channel Four. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the sleepy Sunday morning afternoon yeah. vintage TV that had roll. On, roll you really, are, you really are early morning like French animation, like you know Sharky and George and shit like that. And then it oh, goes Sharky into... and George was legendary, mate. <laughs> was, then it goes into was... your US teen comedies, and then yeah, yeah. Oh. that was one of our favourites growing up. That Sharky and George. That lunchtime, <laughs> that lunchtime block of like you know, Little House on the Prairie, and uh, oh, that's when I turn off try and find think. something else. Yeah. But, so yeah, and then, then we got into the crazy two thousands, early two thousands with T uh, four and yeah, the Oaks Omnibus and WWF Heat. So yeah. <laughs> good times. Sponsored by Toyota. I go. I go by Toyota. Sponsors of T four. <laughs> 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 And they are still sponsoring it last time I checked. Really? Shit. Wow. So, yeah. I go by Toyota, still sponsors entertainment on four. <laughs> oh, shit. When you just sort of come in two at like 11 a.m. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> go on, Jason. <laughs> um, and I was just going to mention Grammar Purist's uh, comments that he put in the Discord too. Um, and I believe Grammar Purist is from the States. So some of his TV shows probably didn't debut for us until like 2000. But um, um, he said a lot of great shows debuted in the States that year. South Park, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Stargate, which we're going to mention later. King of the Hill, Ali McBeal, oh. Just Shoot Me, um, and The Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. Uh, and some of the real bad ones he wanted to mention included Teen Night Rider. Oh, and, God. Uh, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, the TV show. And, oh, no. And I'm <laughs> Alan Partridge. How dare he? <laughs> so, so the humour uh, doesn't translate to the US, clearly. So. <laughs> clearly not, no. Um, so if you want to uh, get in on the conversation, the, it did carry on getting to wrestling as well. So um, <laughs> Sorry. If, <laughs> that was cool, man. It was great. Um, so, so if you want to get your opinion in there and get show, uh, shared on the show, then and join in with the conversation that we're having over on our Discord, then please do so. You can find the link 
in the show notes. So let's get on to the main topics, and that's our picks for the TV shows of 1997. And Rich? Yes. Let's start with uh, your pick. So we've got uh, Stargate SG-1, Men Behaven Badly, and your pick is? It's Brass Eye. <laughs> yeah, let's just, just rip that band-aid off, shall we? You're an addict. Drug bankers pulled my wife's head off and puked down the neck hole. Cake. I'll give you 30 quid for one clarky cat. I don't know it. Cake. It's also legal to buy and sell drugs through a mandrill. Cake. Give it a stark image. I'm talking about something like Dennis Potter in uh, the Blue Velvet. Brass Eye, Wednesday, 9.30 on 4. I don't know even how to um, broach this. I mean, Brass Eye was created by... Um, the writer of uh, the BBC's The Day Today, uh, Chris Morris, and it's got lots of the the alumni from that said show as well. Basically, it was a satirical take on your um, essentially like current affairs magazine shows of the time. This is kind of like your panorama kind of um, dispatches type shows where they will cover lots of you know very what's the best way to put it. Just you know, your typical subjects that we you know encounter in real life, you know things like animals, sex, crime, paedophilia, um, decline, drugs, all that stuff, mm. and it does it in an incredibly satirical, incredibly dark way. So and very, the whole it's a very straight faced, isn't it? Oh, completely, without a doubt. And essentially, yeah, the show of yeah, the purpose of the show isn't to like punch down, take the piss out of people that. Well, you know, victims of certain things like crime or drugs, but more the way that the media um, around that time really started to um, sensationalize and create panic. They love to conjure up that feeling of hysteria. Um, and Brasso basically just mocked that like culture of fear that they were like perpetrating, mm. um, including things that like they would bring in celebrities to take parts in you know, campaigns. Clearly, they weren't actually in tune with they hadn't done their research on so there'll be you have Gary Lineker whoever talking about you know a fictional drug a fictional drug called cake um there was a debate on what constitutes good aids or bad aids um they covered this um crime wave that was sweeping certain council estates called git surfing where uh, teenagers in the absence of cars they would hijack people <laughs> and throw them through shop windows and then loot the shops. Um, usually to steal, was it um, fags, mags, and something else? I can't remember. Booze, fags, and mags. That was it. Um, and yeah, it, it's just an absolutely insane show. Like, and it was always it's it's it is my sense of humour so through and through. But it's the absurd, absurdist nature of it, just how completely dark it is. Um, you got this bit where they kind of um, they have this infomercial about taking drugs through dogs using the dog as like a vessel, but it was done in this really like blurry Chinese style, so like it could be ripped off a VHS tape in Asia. It's just weird. There was another thing where they had security footage of a paedophile that was disguised as a school. <laughs> yeah, he really is a shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I just, yeah, I, I don't, honestly, this is the most I've ever struggled with talking about a show, Yeah, but there's no, like, linear path to a tech no, approach it from, I'm like, here's a set of characters, here's your overall plot line, here's the themes, It it's just, revisiting this, now, I was just cackling like a loon, and just, yeah, watching some of it through gritted teeth, just like, God, I can't believe they went there, like, mm. and yeah. on, on top of it, like, a lot of the things they talk about, like, the things that have actually come to pass, like, I know we kind of talked about it before we started recording, but there's a bit where they talk about vertical farms, you know, and those are actually kind of a thing now, not to the extent mm. that they are in a, you know, brass side, they're not miles into the sky, you know, susceptible to strong winds. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it goes to show, like, a lot of great comedic minds, Chris Morris in particular, he gets what's going on, he sees what's ahead of us and he lampoons it and he nails it he absolutely nails it and some of it is quite terrifying that we're actually heading that way but yeah I mean it is hard to talk about the show like you say just because of the subjects that they kind of broached, approached on and 
Um, you do. I mean, when I I watched a few back last week, and um, you do feel a little bit bad when when you when you see some of the the the, the, the subjects that they're they're kind of taking uh, the, the piss out of, really, basically, yeah. and stuff. But um, like we were saying before, we, we recorded and stuff. Like there, there's always a message. They're always trying to say something to the audience, I guess, aren't they, through the yeah. show and what they're doing. You know, they're not just doing it just to be out there. Um, they're not just trying it to be controversial. Well, maybe they are trying to be controversial, I guess, um, but uh, they're trying to bring to light this subject that um, society doesn't want to really or wants to kind of ignore, I guess. Is that fair, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. Or that, you know, a lot of it is stuff that the public actually – lap up because the media tells them to do so yeah. and yeah it's just I find on the media's part they're completely reprehensible and irresponsible and as we all know with the paedophile special um, <laughs> yeah. they totally well on the surface I think they did get it but they didn't get the joke and they were just no. slapping across the front pages of all your red tops about you know sick Morris pedo special you know, mocking the victims and victims' families is like you didn't get this, did you? Like, no, it wasn't but, going after victims or the no, families no. or anything. He was going after the people that, again, we said before we start recording, he was going after the people that snapped back, and he succeeded. Yep, yeah. yeah. in spectacular fashion, and yeah, it could seem a bit awkward, but. He's lampooning how far these magazine shows made for the masses than the most common denominator. He was lampooning the lengths that they go to to make a point and to stretch things out. And these shows are still doing it today. <laughs> That's the insulting part of the whole thing. Yeah. They they kind of, in a way, conned these big-name celebrities to make an appearance yeah. in this yeah, magazine Yeah, there's something I wanted to mention episode. about it, yeah. But like we said earlier, there's no easy way to bring it up other than just to bring it up. Like, yeah. like who was manipulating who to get them on? But also, you've got to take into account that he was also... This is where it gets really meta. He's also getting at how stupid celebrities can be by just saying yes to everything just for a paycheck. Mm -hmm. Just for a shameless plug or an appearance. Oh, it's yeah, like the uh, the classic Vanessa Feltz doing the recorded messages for um, yeah. convicted murderers. Yeah. Which and... I, I want to just quote verbatim now because I've got it in front of me. It's so good. <laughs> but I won't. Go on, Chris. No, it's just... Uh... <laughs> I, it was Phil I... Collins. It was Phil Collins, wasn't it? It was, yes. Yeah. Talking I'm talking nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> Now well, he, he even mentioned... Isn't... Brit Eklund and Wolf from Gladiators, yeah. and they made them to believe that an East German elephant named Carla had got got her trunk stuck up her yep. proverbial. <laughs> yeah, get know. her trunk out before she explodes into was it? Yeah, into and, a oh something a shower of popped yams. <laughs> <laughs> she needs wolf power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh shit, man! Um, and they had this. An, it was a like an animal rights theme first episode. We capped off Brintley with a poem read out in a cheap hotel room by Nicholas Parsons, <laughs> yes. which was which was chopped up cassette boy style to highlight how gullible <laughs> the celebrities have been. Mm. <laughs> when it throws the Chris Morris's face, he's like. Well, <laughs> just like, no, was it? no more can an elephant stick its trunk up at its ass than we could lick our balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, oh my god. Fucking hell. It's the, one of the ones that really still hits me hard is the science episode. Um, where they talk about how science, they basically put science on the dock, complete with a visual of a test tube sitting in a court. And, um, <laughs> I've forgotten it, about that. <laughs> it just goes into stuff. There's a bit where there's um, celebrities and. Um, I forget who it is now, um, but they talk about, um, they promote a charity, basically, that's um, trying to prevent heavy electricity, flattening cattle in a village in Sri Lanka, um, and just like the whole like feeling of like fear and suspicion of science that they create in that, and without zero research whatsoever, and you look at that with where we are today, with like 
fake news and you know mm-hmm. facts don't care about your feelings and like you got like gove saying about you know we've had enough of reports or experts sorry um when they were talking about like i think they were talking about global warming it shows that we are just going backwards or we're always mm-hmm. just as bad but we are not as we haven't we're not regressing in the way we think we are we are just idiots well. The news from the last three days um, <laughs> puts that a bit into perspective. Mm. It, you'd have to remind me now because I feel like so many things bloody happens. <laughs> That's the whole, uh, you know, trigger warning. The whole United States anti-abortion stuff. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. of course, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's like going back to the dark ages, like seriously. Uh, but again, these laws are written by middle-aged, pasty, fat white men sitting in high chairs. Yeah, it's like <laughs> get fucked. But I think I think that is just the beautifulness of this program was the fact that they use uh, this media to to get these subjects to people's attention. I think, and they found that the only way they could do that is through this satirical comedy style that Chris um, created for, for this show. And it, like we say, it obviously worked uh, to a certain point to get these kind of different and difficult subjects. To, to the attention of people. Um, yeah. And like we mentioned about the paedophile special episode that they did in 2001. And, and you know, and it's, uh, everyone, a lot of people would say that it still contains one of the darkest British comedy sketches that's ever been done on British TV with the, uh, the, the paedophile that they catch and they put it in the, put, put him in the, um, in the locks. And, you know, he, oh, he God, Simon Pegg wasn't it? Jesus it was Simon yeah. Pegg. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, sorry, yeah, sorry, I think you were building up to that. I'm sorry. Yeah, it just, no, it just popped in my head. Yeah. <laughs> and and it was like, you know, um Chris brings out his pretend son and asks him, you know, like, do you want to have sex with my son? And it's like, Am I supposed to find this funny? Or you know, it that show just has that kind of power on you and like mm. puts you right on the uncomfortable line of like <laughs> Should, should I find that funny or not? It was really, you know, it's it's really difficult to know sometimes, isn't it? But um, I think that's, I found Rich probably laughed at that bit. <laughs> I did, I laughed, because it's, I mean, it's all about the fact that Chris is hurt, that he doesn't find him attractive. Yeah. He's like, mm-hmm. I don't find him attractive. Good. <laughs> he's like, doesn't look at all happy. He's like really offended that like his son's not attractive to so this creepy man in stocks. It's so good. It just... Yeah, I, I get it. I do get it. It's like, it really skirts that line. Mm. But, yeah. It's, I don't know. It, it's just damn good stuff. Um, and, yeah, the pedophile special, I know we feel like we're cheating a little bit, drifting to 2001, I think it came out. Um, yeah. But you can't talk about Brasso without talking about that special. It's no. just next level stuff. It's so good. I mean, you've got Richard Blackwood talking about how kids on the internet, if they're being abused online, they come away smelling of hammers. And uh, <laughs> and there's a the one MP said our child was stuck in an area of the internet the size of Ireland. I was just, I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> well, that kid came away completely 2D. It's just like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, it just, everything. Okay. Yeah, just, I guess the other thing about this show is the fact that it is just so 90s like Mm -hmm. you know no one could really i mean i know we have the internet so people just do it on the internet now i guess but i mean no one could walk into a tv studio now and pitch this show and get green light would they Uh, yeah you're right it's it's funny how it's kind of like we kind of peak and trough in terms of what's acceptable now. Like everyone talks about like the old days of films and, you know, you got to a point where things could did they did push the envelope more, but then we feel like we have gone back a bit. There's certain things we will do now. They probably didn't even do in the nineties, but mm. stuff like this, I don't know if it's because they don't feel they can, or even if they don't feel they need to, because you've got the voices now out there that are so much more, there's so many different platforms out of here, voices of people, whether, you know, they're just commentators or satirists. It almost feels like you don't need to fill that void with like a TV show on a, you know, traditional linear TV channel. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I, cause I don't think there would be like the hysteria now. I just don't know if there's an appetite for it. Mm. Cause you haven't got, you know, the merry white houses of the world. Yeah. Um, out it's- there. 
they're all on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, or, or dead, <laughs> like everyone else. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it would be rude of me. I, yeah, I touched upon it earlier, but I have to cover the uh, the Vanessa Feltz <laughs> um, recorded message um, for convicted murderers from the crime special, which uh, is as follows. Um, Hello, you think you don't know me, don't you? Yes, but you do, because I'm the shopkeeper who, sh- who you shot in a mindless hold-up. You blow up my guts, remember? <laughs> it's like, I'm the old lady whose head you stoved in with a loose wardrobe in the middle of the night, remember? I'm the little boy whose face you stabbed off in a panic when I found you robbing my house, remember? I'm Marvin Gaye, shot by my own father. Oh yes, you know me, all right? <laughs> just, oh God, that final line just gets me every time. It's fantastic. The most I've ever enjoyed Vanessa felt. So <laughs> thank you, Chris Morris. Just an absolutely stunning show. I, yeah, I, I could go on all day about this, but it would yeah, just be quotes. Yeah. It would just be boring. I would just put a link to the quotes.net page on a, yeah. the show notes. I think it'd be easier. So yeah. And there's, of course, there's the bit with, um, I think it was the uh, animals episode with uh, the guy who uh, was abusing that cow. Mm-hmm. The cow that basically turned out to be his landlord because it inherited loads of money from a crazed old. <laughs> A crazed old woman, um, and basically the cow was stopped piling rent, and uh, <laughs> it owned the land the guy was living on. So he just abused it by piping abuse into its head with a headset, saying stuff like, uh, "You don't know what electricity is, do you?" <laughs> and uh, graffitiing stuff near on the cow's shed that said stuff like, uh, "Jam stuff in cow's twat," <laughs> uh, "Cow going to be chops." Uh, yeah, it's just fantastic. So. Amazing stuff. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, it's a snapshot of the nineties and and you know the controversial way of TV at the time, and it was um, a, a strong part of the, the the Channel Four Friday night programming that we had, the the, the amazing Channel Four program we had at the time. But um, apparently, the series was made in nineteen ninety six, but because of its hugely controversial nature, airing <laughs> was delayed. By wow. Channel 4 until early 97, <laughs> while they undertook a long editing process and considered which parts they could get away with broadcasting. What didn't get yeah, featured? I, I didn't know it took that long. I think I bet it's the DVDs, because I've got them. I need to find out what features are on there again. I remember. Good God, have... what got cut? Mm. The um, Pedo Geddon special <laughs> is the... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> It's the third it's most... It's been so long and I still <laughs> laugh at that word. <laughs> you can't see you won't be able to say the word British. I was putting the word peed off in front of it. I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> it's the third most complained about episode of television. Either, even... Oh, sorry. The Peter Geddon special is the third most complained about episode of television ever. This... First and second are the Jerry Springer Opera and Big Brother 2000. Wow. <laughs> wow. Well, to me, that is proof that Christopher Morris is doing his job correctly. Exactly. Exactly. Let's move on to lighter notes, shall we, Chris, with um, your TV pick of 1997. Yep, mine is the ever-popular therapy kind of show, spin-off from the 1994 Ryan Emmerich movie, Stargate SG-1. Come on, please tell me what the hell is going on. You're recovering from a gunshot wound. What? You have no recollection of the incident. No, who shot me? Don't change the subject. What do you remember? I went to see Colonel Vasilov, and right in the middle of our conversation, he collapsed, and I went to help him, and that's it. You don't remember accompanying him to the infirmary? No. Who shot me? You were shooting up the gate room. You wounded two guards. We think we may be dealing with a foothold situation. Specifically an alien entity capable of taking over human hosts, not unlike the Gwa'uld. And it seems to be able to travel from person to person. Although at present we have no knowledge of how this is possible. Daniel? Anubis. Daniel Jackson. I was Anubis. Rather, uh, Anubis was controlling me. Anubis is dead. No, he's not. And he's here in the base. 
cool choice. Um, I, it, Stargate, to me, I never really watched it back in the day. And I think uh, when I was talking to Christian last week about Babylon 5 and saying I was a bit of a Star Trek, um, I don't know, like I always chose Star Trek over everything else. And I think this show was also uh, a sufferer of, of me being a, a being the snob, the Star Trek snob that I was. And um, it's like, no, I'm not going to watch this. It can't be as good as Star Trek. So I never really bothered. I, I did oh. kind of dip my toes in a little bit further down the line and I did watch a few of them and I enjoyed what I watched, to be honest. And I was a bit kicking myself. I'm like, what? Well, you know, I shouldn't have had that mentality. Um, oh. But but what 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 is it about Stargate that made it be your choice? It technically didn't arrive over here till 98. Mm. Um, but it was the only thing that debuted in 97 it might have been on Sky TV in 97 I'm not too sure in the UK but um, it again like you said Jason I've been a Star Trek fan since I was little so you're looking at early 90s maybe 1990, 1991 so like you I would always gravitate towards that first so it took me a long time to watch things like Babylon 5 and stuff like that. It was around the same time. And I have very happy memories linked to Stargate SG-1 because it was a show that we could all watch as a family and all enjoy. And that's exclusively because of its modern day contemporary setting that my mum was fine watching it and my brother was fine watching it because it was contemporary and they had, you know... US Air Force. Basically, mm-hmm. the story is it's spun off from the film. And if you guys haven't, if no one's seen the original Stargate movie, what are you doing on this podcast? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sort of once. And, yeah. And it was, it was the usual, um, adapted from a film. You, you're going to change a few things, and that's always going to be cast members. And it came off a bit better. I think, the Ron Emmerich and Dean Devlin's film. Yes, the film asks you questions that people have been asking for hundreds, if not thousands of years. But I think SG-1, it was such a feel-good show, like any Star Trek show, or any show, it's got that perfect balance. It's set in present day. It's yeah, basically... Yeah, it's basically Star Trek without the ships. Yeah. And, until... Later on in the season, when it morphs in from Stargate to Star Tr- Stargate colon Star Trek, when they get ships and stuff like that. Oh, what universe? I love Stargate Universe. It's a quality no, show. Later on in SG One, they get oh, okay. the um, the big ships that um, the System Lords, whatever. But but again, I'm not one of those super rivet counter nerds who know everything about the show that was crafted and about the lore. But by setting it in present day using a military setting with an an ancient slash futuristic thing, a portal can take you from one planet to another. But they take Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin's idea and really run with it and make their own unique little thing with it. And it, it's, yeah, I, they do I, it really well. Yeah, I was really impressed on how much they got out of that original premise of, of, of the Stargate. Mm. Um, and I know they probably, they had a bit of work. They had some stuff to work with, I guess, with all the different symbols on the actual Stargate, you know, and, and being able to go to all these different worlds, but it's still the way that they managed to flesh it, flesh out that I, that original idea. Yeah. Was quite um, amazing for me, to me. They, I don't think they had access to Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin's original treatments for the idea and the script. But the original plan from Roland Emmerich was a trilogy of films where you get the first film that sets it up, then the second film elaborates on it, and then the third film will be even more elaboration and then a massive payoff. But MGM weren't interested because the film apparently didn't perform as well as they wanted it to, so mm-hmm. they didn't greenlight a sequel. Mm-hmm. But a few years later, uh, Dom DeLuise's son yep. turns around and says uh, to his... Uh, What's the name that was another producer. But um, he said, you know, what about if we adapt that film Stargate into a TV show? And it was one of those weird things, I think, where Roland Emmerich and Dean Devlin's idea of having multiple symbols on the Stargate, meaning like a telephone, it could dial anywhere, mm. 
and the guys who developed SG1 were like, well, surely enough, there's like, you know, all these symbols on this gate, it can go anywhere, right? And then it just, the show kind of just like formed and wrote itself in a way, because they had their own Star Trek show, but they didn't have to set it in the future, because mm-hmm. they'd set it up in the, fir- in the original film as this contemporary military unit that has found this ancient device, which enables you to travel across vast distances through just walking through a puddle of energy, event horizon. And it just encapsulates, I think, everything great that can be done with television if you have the right people. And obviously, they wanted Richard Dean Anderson. And for yeah. anyone who doesn't know Richard Dean Anderson, if you've just got watched you know, the old MacGyver shows from the eight, the eighties, and and he, he wasn't originally that interested in it, was he? No, no, not at all. Because um, he'd seen the film, and he was like, "I can't." I think the main reason was he thought himself that he can't take on that Kurt Russell character because it was too dark, it was too brooding, it was, you know. So they they changed a few things, but they kept his son. The plot point of his son killing himself with Jack's own gun, they kept that in there as a plot point, as a motivational plot point for the character. And then they got Rich Dean Anderson and he came on as executive producer, so they had a massive name in television there that could, you know, keep the show kind of like alive in a way. And then you had all the other actors, you had Christopher Judge comes on and, and again, just like Star Trek, the key four members of this team this air force military team that are going through this through stargate you have that perfect balance of three or four character traits and i think they did really well with the casting of these characters as well it was it was brilliant and michael shanks came in and if you look at the the dvd features and the interviews i believe they're all available on youtube actually michael shanks got the part because he came in and did a spot-on impression of james spader he even brought a pair of glasses on the way to the audition. Mm. Took the popped the lenses out so he could turn up in glasses. And luckily, Michael Shanks had a full head of floppy hair, just like James <laughs> Spader did. So it was, yeah. it was a perfect storm. And he went in and just did a literally a pinpoint impression of James Spader, and they employed him on the spot. Like, yeah, you got it. Now, funnily enough, I remember being when I was a kid watching it for the first time. I remember asking my mum. I was just like, "That is the same guy from the film." And she's like, "No." No, it's not. I was convinced yeah. as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old that... I was exactly the same. <laughs> I, I thought they got the same actor in yeah. from the film. I was like, that's that's got to be the actor. And it wasn't. Mm. And it was stunning. And you had... Daniel was the passion and, you know, the passion and the knowledge part. And you had this neutral middle, which was uh, Richard Dean Anderson's Jack O'Neill, where he was the the military type, that kind mm-hmm. of like kid who would never listen to school but would just get through by his wits and jokes and stuff like that. But everyone balancing around him, you had the Spock archetype. You had that mm-hmm. logical, computer-minded thing of Tilk. And yes, he was an alien. Well, sort of. So he didn't understand a lot of Earth's or English terminology and stuff like that. So you had that fish-out-of-water element and also the logical element coming from him as well, as a seasoned soldier, basically, is what it was. And then you had this amazing crackpot um, scientist, Dr. Sam Carter, comes on. So she's not only a military person, but she's also a very well-accomplished scientist, balancing the whole lot out. So it had that perfect dynamic that you have in the top three or four of Star Trek, when they kind of get that kind of archetypes together. And I think it just fell beautifully together. And they, I think they took a casting of the original gate because when they found it, it was on like, it was on like MGM's back lot, like in the sun, like Mm. rotting to pieces, I think, if I remember rightly. They took a few casts of it and then made several copies in fiberglass. One, One or two working with a motor that they could take on location or whatever. And then the rest were just stunt copies. But yeah, they replicated the original gate and the sets they had the amazing don s davis would turn up as general hammond and again he had such a fatherly presence and it balanced it it was like you know obviously don s davis he started out as a stuntman if i remember rightly and he stunt doubled for people in the 80s for airwolf macgyver magnum pi that kind of stuff but 
he balanced it in a very fatherly, grandfatherly way. He wasn't a stern general. He was that mid-range guy who understood everything, but also could re- rule with an iron rod. Mm. And obviously, it's the planet of the week trope. The mm. the mission and the pilot is obviously Daniel's wife that he marries on the that he gets together with on the planet gets taken by this new system, this new villain, this new system lord. Everyone's convinced it's Ra. It's not. So the whole premise of the show is to find Daniel Jackson's wife and to find technology that they can cannibalize to fight this threat that's being sent to Earth. And then it is just that planet of the week. Cause a few two-parters it sets up the law. You've got historical episodes. You've got futuristic episodes. But it is done so well and believable and you get that military warfare thrown in you get the science thrown in you get the history lesson thrown in you get the humor and it all balances perfectly you had the perfect storm there of creators producers writers and actors and that comes along very rarely i guess we have to thank godzilla in some way because uh, <laughs> yeah. because obviously if for old emmerich was not tied into making that film he might have had more of an input into the TV show Stargate, and it may not have turned out the way it had. No, uh, Roland and Dean didn't have anything to do with the show. Mm. It was a completely separate branch of people working at MGM that came across and said, we can make a show out of this film. Yeah. Like, and I, look at look at this, you know, and this is what we can do with this. And then they, they were, MGM were like, okay. Next thing you know, 11 years later, four yeah. TV movies and two more <laughs> spin-offs and an animated show later... It's it became as big as Star Trek did yeah, in I mean, the nineties and two thousands. I think it's it's still like one of the longest running science fiction TV shows. Uninterrupted, yes, I believe so. Because they did ten ten series of SG one, didn't they? Before they went um, yeah, to Atlantis, I think it was season ten was really disappointing. Everyone was like, "Oh, they're gonna oh, we're gonna go out on this, are we?" And there was this whole big fanfare of goodbye TV land. You know, SG one's going and has very kind of like somber ending to the show. And everyone's like, oh, is that it? And then just like many shows, especially Star Trek before it, the fan outcry was just like, the fuck guys, really? <laughs> <laughs> and they got given another season, season 11, and then it just kept going. And then, you know, Ben Browder and Claud- Claudia Black came over from Farscape, added that more of that... <coughs> You can see the, ch- the, ch- the show changing. Richard Ian Anderson wanted to leave because his dad was suffering from leukemia. Mm. So he wanted to leave. And then gradually the other actors wanted to leave. And Don S. Davis, he died. So then the new blood comes in. Ben Browder from Farscape and Claudia Black, who added that lovely balance. And I thought it was fantastic. And then Atlantis spun off from SG-1. And then Universe spun off from Atlantis. And you had some sort of crappy animated show. And, and now... Recently, we've had Stargate Origins, which has been a, I think, web-only exclusive mm-hmm. streaming platform-esque project. Um, but yeah, they answered the call and they came. They came back, and I believe from 1997 to when did the Universe end? Four year ago. No, it's been five longer years than that, ago? isn't it? Maybe five years ago. So maybe 2017. I look, it was longer than that, to be honest. But it well, might like be 2012 was... or something, maybe. I can't remember, but I know it's one of America's longest running but uninterrupted run of t- TV. I think obviously Star Trek beats it to the post, not including the original series, because obviously there was like a you know, well, was like an 18 year gap between next gen and the original series, so. The Stargate Universe uh, premiered in 2009, so it had two series, so um, it must have been I about did. 2011 I time. didn't realise it was that long ago. Mm. That's I was really glad about Star- Stargate Universe, because like I said, I, I jumped into some of the SG-1 ones, and when I heard about this one starting, I was like, well, I'm, I'm in for this one. Let, let's start, let's get in at the beginning of this show, so... I can see what it's about and see if I can get into the Stargate world. And obviously that was um, going to be difficult because this was like Stargate that nobody had ever really known before because yeah. it was like completely different. You know, they're on a ship, they're all stuck in space and um, 
and and obviously they had a Stargate on the ship, but you know they were mostly on on this spaceship, and it yeah. was not Stargate as everyone knew Stargate as, and that's why it crumbled in the end because the fans just couldn't resonate with it. Um, yeah, and that's what happened with the later seasons where I kind of tapped out a little bit because what gravitated me towards Stargate was it was so different to Star Trek, yet very similar in the same way. Yeah. And you had some beautifully shot episodes of cinematography and some of the SG-1 episodes and the location shoots are stunning. Mm. And that's what separated Star Trek from SG-1 was, yes, every planet looks like Vancouver National Park, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's obviously where it was all filmed. But the location shots, you know, very rarely were they on a studio for a planet shot. There was in the, for in the National Park forests or... Occasionally down at the California Redwoods where Return of the Jedi was filmed, you know, and and again it grounded it. But when Stargate SG-1 started to use the big massive ships from the alien races, I kind of a bit of me was a bit like, this is now resembling what the show deliberately didn't want to resemble in the first place. It became mm -hmm. something it didn't intend to be, but that was, I suppose, a natural progression. I, I yeah. don't know. But you've got that mixture of like that that law that they write into the into the film as well, where the gate only works one way. Mm. You can't dial it, go through it, and then go back through it. If you go back through it, you're you're dead. It only works one way. You have to dial it from the other side to come back. So when that's cut off, or they go to a planet without that funky dial home device thing. And they've got to do it manually. They, it's like, there's a bit of peril there. But again, it all happen, it's all fine in the end. You know, mm. They'll get home happy. Of but course. It's later seasons as well. I, I started college as well. So I kind of tapped out of the Stargate thing. Because mm. obviously college, and then you work in late evenings, and you just forget these things exist. Yep. Yep, and unfortunately. Think, yeah. And the, the later seasons, they were, they were enjoyable. Obviously, when Richard Dean Anderson left it, didn't take a nosedive, it was just a different dynamic. It's like any any show that has a different cast it's like, brought on. It's like Mulder leaving the X-Files, wasn't it? You know, mm. the show yeah, just didn't got, quite yeah. feel the same afterwards, did it? Yeah, this guy's, you know, been with the show since its early inception. He was, you know, one of the people who were helped to bring it into existence, to develop this character with these cr the show creators. And there's some stellar performances, but then he started taking a back seat and would only appear in 10 episodes of every 20 and then it started to be every two episodes of every 20 as you know as it went on and then but that was quite nice where they gradually phased him out he didn't just leave die some like yeah. tragic accident was, <laughs> yeah and you know sg1 has a really loyal and understanding fan base and mm -hmm. it's nice the mm -hmm. sg1 fan base is a really nice place to be a part of especially when you sort of end up <coughs> on the old message boards and yeah i just i've very fond memories of us as a family watching it all together and it's very rare that something that I'm interested in the whole family would be and it was it mm. was quite rare and yeah. it was enjoyable so that's my my happy memories for Stargate SG-1 now and of course um Stargate has a you know small connection with Star Trek with uh, Robert Picardo oh um, yeah they being are. a reoccurring character in in uh Atlantis yep and you had John Billingsley putting an appearance as well Mm -hmm. who is Phlox in Enterprise. Yes. And that was right. a phenomenal episode called The Other Guys, where it told an episode purely from the, essentially the Red Shirt's point of view. Mm -hmm. And the main cast are literally glorified cameos. And yet yeah, this beautiful episode, and I can't remember who the other actor is. And it tells it from their point of view, where they're stuck in this fish out of water thing. They're stuck in these villains' uniforms that they've blended into the thing, and they've got this thing on their head, and... It's done so well, and only an actor as accomplished as John Billingsley can carry it off without mm -hmm. it being too lampoonish. Mm. He can balance that perfectly. Um, but yeah, lo loads of cross pollination from other <laughs> shows ended up. Oh. And they they even did an amazing episode actually, the two hundredth, I believe, and they took and at the time it's the mid two thousands, two thousand. 
three or four maybe, where the 200th episode was, they're all sitting around the table, and this guy comes in and he's producing a, a film or a TV show about the Stargate program, but this guy turns out to be an alien, and they're all sitting around the table throwing these ideas at like what we could do. So you have the you have the obligatory Star Trek episode where they're all kitted out in tightly fitting lycra uniforms. The bridge is all bright coloured and noisy and flashy lighty and stuff like that. And then you have the Team America episode idea where they're all puppets. Mm. I don't know if you guys have seen clips of this at all. No, not this one. No. No. It's it's actually quite cleverly done because it's not it's not like a hallucination. It's literally three three or four guys throwing ideas around a table. Like, what could we do with this movie? Like <laughs> And yeah, the the Team America style one, and then you get the Farscape style one, because obviously Ben Browder and Claudia Black were in Farscape, so you get that thrown in, and it's, it's very cleverly done. And the puppet work is fantastic. I'm not sure if they're the same guys who did the puppet work for Team America, but they rebuild the set and the costumes all small scale for these puppets, and do a little mini thing of Stargate in puppet in Team America style puppets. That sounds awesome. It's it's one of the things that Stargate did well because it was based contemporarily, contemporary, and grounded itself in a way. These were all kind of things happening in the person's head who was describing what they're going to do. Mm. Yeah, that sounds so awesome. they get so they get away with it. Mm. They get away with it in a way. Yeah. It's not like a holodeck episode, but yeah. <laughs> I everyone who you know wants a a sci-fi light, I suppose yeah. you could call it a SG one before watching. it started. Yeah, before it started getting really heavy into its concepts, it was very light sci-fi. It was like, you know, G.I. Joe does sci-fi, you know. It was, and it it wasn't over-militaristic either. It was, mm. it was a nice balance. And, yeah, if you guys want some light sci-fi, just queue up SG-1. I believe Amazon now owning MGM. I'm pretty sure it's free now for most Amazon subscribers. Yeah, it's probably there somewhere, yeah. Yeah. Well, what about yourself, Rich? You've been very I'm, quiet here. I um, watched, I watched it. <laughs> I watched the first film once. Well, okay. The first yeah. film, the only film. Yeah. Um, and yeah, maybe I've seen bits of the show in the background. Mm-hmm. But I've but it was always dabbled. on Channel 4 on like Sunday mornings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember it well. I remember all the TV ads for it. But mm. Never dabbled, not this, not Atlantis, not mm. um, Universe, none of that stuff, I'm afraid. So, Fair enough. Can't watch yeah, it all, mate. Can't watch it no. all. Well, certain concepts of Stargate travel were phased out over the course of the first season, such as the travellers feeling extremely cold and arriving mm. with frost on their faces. Also, the concept of the travellers unable to keep their balance and always tumbling out of the Stargate, unless, of course, they tumbled into the Stargate to begin with. Mm. This was explained within the show as a result of more precise dialing of the Earth Stargate, and sometimes these effects are brought back when the wormhole is disturbed during transit. The real reason was budget and pacing. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> it's always about the money. Because after the first five episodes, you forget that they get cold and yeah. disoriented. So you just move on. Oh, they've gone through the gate. Okay, we're on a yeah. different planet now. Move on. <laughs> yeah. um, Sergeant Walter Harriman was loosely based on Walter Radar, O-ra- mm-hmm. O-ra- Radar O'Reilly from MASH. Throughout the series, we see Walter display many radar-like qualities, particularly his ability to respond the request of his superiors before being asked. Coincidentally, both characters were portrayed by actors named Gary. Yeah. And go. if I remember rightly, he was a stand-up comic as well, which makes his comic timing as the scientist slash engineer physicist makes the comic timing even funnier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I can see that. I remember finding that out. I think it was on the season one DVD. I was talking about how they found, you know, this actor had been bit parts in like Seinfeld and stuff like that like here and there and he was a yeah he was a stand up comic at slash actor and he, he said yeah I'll do a part on your show next thing you know he's, <laughs> he's been in like 11 seasons on and off with a few guest <laughs> spots on the spin off so like mad <laughs> okay I'm sure he was very happy to have said that you suggested that now yeah yeah um, well there's just one more pick left and that's my pick and um, as you probably worked out, my pick was uh, Men Behaving Badly. Come out. Come out. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. Ah, oh, no, I dropped him again. Yeah. Should we use my keys? Keys? 
That's a good idea. I was looking for me bollocks. <laughs> I'm going to knock on Deborah's door. Well, it can't do any harm, can it? That's the convenient thing about calling on people in the middle of the night. They're always in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really ready to seduce her now. Yeah. Uh, I've planned it in the minutest detail. Yeah. What are you going to say? <sighs> say? <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> oh, say. Yeah. I'm going to compliment her on her hair as we discussed. Yeah. And then I'm going to subtly ask her out for a tea, for a scone. Yeah. And I'm going to tell her how much I love her. Yeah. And she'll smile sweetly. Yeah. I sod it, I just shout out. Deborah! I f***ing love you! Come down! I want you! <laughs> I think Dorothy's locked this. Why would she do that? I don't know, I just can't think. I don't know why. Uh, that's not working. <laughs> I'll make it ring. Ring! ring! When Behaving Badly uh, was a show that arrived to me at the perfect time of my life. I think because I was just out of school when I discovered the show, when it moved from ITV to BBC One. Oh, Harry um, Jesus. And, you know, I, I caught it when they brought Neil Morrissey in and, and uh, Harry, Enfield, Harry Enfield had left. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I started watching it. And I was at that age, you know, I'd just left school. I was working. I was just going into college. It's a bit like Chris. And, um, you know, you're at that time of your life, all this kind of stuff that they they were approaching was was – What's the word? Um, you know, it was just what your life was like, I guess. Yeah. And it was just so funny just to see these two grown men behave the way that I was behaving <laughs> at 18, I think. It's a good way of saying it. And just some of the stuff that they came up with that they approached was just so... I don't know, you've just never seen it before on British te television, I guess, you know, and even today I was watching back an episode and it was, you know, Gary had gone into the bedroom to masturbate and, <laughs> you know, he, he got his porn videos out and he got his box of tissues ready. And then it kind of just cut with him laying front down on the bed with his trousers by his ankle. And like Dorothy came in and like they're talking and he's trying to hide the tissues and like tissues getting stuck on his hand and, this, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, and then Gary leaves for, for whatever reason and Dorothy's been laying on the bed. And then as she gets up, there's a tissue that's stuck to her cheek. And, yeah. you know, and it's just so funny. Like, you know, the, the, the episode where Tony decides he wants to be help women in labor and buy these, uh, helped with these birthing pools. And he brings one home. And at the end of the episode, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the episode, it's like, you know, Gary and Tony are just sitting in there with, with like this little float thing that they've made out of a beer can um, so they could um, watch t watch this portable TV while they're in this birthing pool and they've both got their cans of Stella and, you know, and th they're talking <laughs> about whatever happened and, you know, they all just stop. And then, you know, you see the bubbles from where they're farting in the water <laughs> and, and then they belch and, you know, and then... You know, <laughs> It's just so childish kind of like humor but like i say it's it's just a show that arrived at the right time for me and the laddish behavior that they 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 did they they um portrayed on this show was just what in some ways i was portraying in real life and it was a great um way to um connect with this show did um you have any? Do you guys have the same kind of connection with the show? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I definitely do. I mean, kind of like you. I know I'm a little bit younger, James, uh, Jason, but <laughs> as you like to remind me. <laughs> but yeah, this, this too did kind of come around that right time. You know, I was a little bit older. You know, a little bit more. Um, what's the word? Um, a little bit more, you know, provocative stuff. Um, but it was still perfectly, you know, approachable. It wasn't the kind of thing you really shun away from. 
watching with your parents. It wasn't like, you know, tearing on TV or something like that, where it just like, shit, this is, <laughs> all, you know, this is awkward. You know, yeah. watch this on Saturday nights at my nan's house. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but yeah, um, I always, I've always been a bit of a fan of Martin Clunes. I think this was what I introduced me to Neil Morrissey. Yeah. Um, and I, was this around a similar time like shows like Game On came out as well? Because that was another sitcom I really enjoyed. And it had a similar vibe as well to it. Yeah, yes. yeah Samantha Simil- Janus. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I I don't have like strong fond memories of it. I, I, I won't lie, I've not necessarily always been the biggest person when it's come to your know, tra- traditional kind of sitcoms, be they, you know, British ones or ones from the US, but I did have a bit of a place for this show. Um, obviously, you know, the theme tune is as snappy and as memorable as hell, so that's always a good start for a TV show for me. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to really say. Um, mm. I couldn't even re- recount an episode if you told me, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but I'm sure if I watch an episode now, there'll be bits. I'm like, oh, I remember this. Yeah, so, okay. I mean, you must remember the episode that aired where they. Um... They sing I'm a Winker. Yes, I can hear that song. I'm a Winker. I'm a Winker. That's really well should. Yeah, that's rattling around the back of my head now. It, that is familiar. I, just think- I thought I would have more of a place in my heart for this show. I mean, obviously, I was heavily into things like Bottom. Yeah. Mm. And I know this is obviously a bit more restrained, a bit more, you know, mm. confined within reality versus something like that. But it still, in a way, has its similar kind of vibe it's not obviously like an anarchic show but it is very much very much a product of that era yeah and it, and it had that games. you know it had that kind of weird history of like where it started on itv yeah um, and i think it's, it's, it's really kind of like a one-off kind of thing i can't mm-hmm. really think of any other shows that kind of moved from one kind of rival to the other Birds of the Feather did come to ITV um, when you've, what, a couple of years ago. Didn't they do like mm. a little bit of a... Uh, yeah, they came back and it yeah. went from that to ITV. Of a follow-up. Mm. That That's was in the last couple of years as well. Well, it's yeah. fucking old as shit, that show. <laughs> so. But yeah, you know, and, and Harry Enfield, and I think it was quite well known where within in the circles that Harry didn't really get on with doing a sitcom. And it, he wasn't really finding it as good as he was hoping it to be. And I think that's why he left in the end. But I think it worked well in the I end. I think it worked better with Neil Morrissey. I've never been a Harry Enfield fan. Yeah. And I think it works better with Neil Morrissey because mm-hmm. I think Neil Morrissey is one of those very gifted comedic actors. Very much like Ashton Kutcher when he did that 70s show. He He's not just playing a complete doofus. He's playing it with heart and naivety, which makes it more believable mm. and understandable that this, you know, we've all known people like that as well, where you, you know, he's naive, he's not stupid, he's just a bit silly, but he's completely believe, completely believes in his faith. Yeah. <laughs> what he's doing is normal. <laughs> and if, yeah, but, yeah, it's good going, Chris. No, funny enough, again, we used to watch this as a family, weirdly. <laughs> <laughs> well, interesting. Um, well, no, it's like you know, it used to be on, and I remember like coming, like I was, I can't remember what it was. I was like, you know, and I just remember <laughs> us sitting around, and my brother would laugh, but he wouldn't understand a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And I was obviously, I was a bit young as well, so maybe I wasn't understanding most of it. But it was just a f- silly half hour that was on TV. Yeah, that just works really well and it's it's so quintessentially british but at the same yeah. time it, it has that american model and it's really strange mm. i don't know yeah. what it is but something as i've grown older and funny enough me and nick we watched it i think a year ago or so all the way through it appeared on netflix <laughs> so we started watching it and it's got that weird American thing about it. I don't know why. Maybe it's a dynamic or the pacing. I'm not sure. Rob Schneider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too far into it, but it's just like maybe. like standout episodes where Tony gives himself a tattoo to impress Deborah. And it's just like... <laughs> no, I see what you mean. I mean. <laughs> Just sitting on the kitchen counter with a needle yeah. on the flame. Oh, like, God, oh, I remember. Totally. It's bleeding yeah. out. It's horrible. Yeah, oh, Tony... Totally, 
Don't don't bleed to death on the stairs, will you, Tony? <laughs> God, <laughs> I remember going, that. Oh, oh, That's oh, terrifying. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, that was a wooden spoon in his stairs. mouth, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Oh, with, no. like a big needle with a cork on the end. And he's just in the ink. Oh. I think that, that's one of the things I liked about the show, I think, as well, because the characters were were well made. I think it's a good way of saying it. You know, you, you had Gary and Tony, but... You you had um, Dorothy and Deborah, and they were they weren't just the pushover female characters of the show. I mean, they they were they were strong, independent women, and they yeah. they weren't scared to to fight back. And I think that's that worked really well. And I think that the casting when they cast the show, like they seemed to the chemistry between them all seemed to just come through the the, yeah. the show as well, which I think really helped out. But. Um, something I, I learned quite recently was like I, I didn't know that this show was based off a book that Simon Nye oh, wrote really? originally. Yeah, he wrote a book originally, and this is how it came to the attention of um, uh, a lady called. Uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to Beryl. I can't remember her Beryl, name now. Beryl Virtue. That's it. Yes, that would be the uh, mother in law of Stephen Moffat. There you go. Really? I didn't know that either. Oh. <laughs> Well, Steve, Wait, Stephen no. Moffat met and married Sue Virtue, which is Belle Virtue's daughter. Oh, okay. I did that. There you go, ladies and gents. Learn something new every day. Oh, Chris. And um, she... I, she... I, I, in my defence, I found that out completely by chance. <laughs> it was in an interview that I read on Doctor Who about 10 years ago when, you know, obviously Matt Smith was still a doctor, and I was like, mm-hmm. oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of makes sense when you think about Stephen Moffat's comedy career. Yeah. Before Doctor Who, yeah, it makes yeah. total sense. Yeah, that's that crazy. Was, uh, Great. Um, I'll yeah, get my but- coat. <laughs> No, please don't. And she said, um, you know, she picked up this book and she thought that this would make a good, a, 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 a good TV show. And she took it to ITV and she she persuaded the people there to get it made. And obviously, we know the way that they came. And when they said they weren't going to renew it for a series three, um, you know, she was the one that picked it up and took it to BBC and said, you know will you take this show up because ITV are not interested in it anymore. And like they, they were fine. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll, we'll take, um, take this show because in their eyes, you know, men behaving badly was, was quite a well um, received show and it had, a, it was quite a popular show. And I don't, you know, it's not easy to just create a, a, a popular sitcom, is it? You know, so if one's just going to fall in your laps, you're not going to say no. And, and I think the other positive when they moved to the BBC was like it was post watershed, so they could they could um, you know they could be a bit more risque with with some of the stuff and, and and not have to worry about you know there's only so many times you can say golly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> instead of something else in the show and stuff. <laughs> so it was it, it's got an interesting history to it as well, and um, Martin Clunes plays Gary so well, and I didn't even know he was in Doctor Who. Oh yeah, he did. Oh <laughs> shit! Which episode was that again? Um, it was a, a it was a Colin Baker one yeah. or Peter Davison one, and he's just all ears and lips. <laughs> well, he yeah. looks like Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> and well, again, I I never watched classic Doctor Who. Yeah. It was never I was never really interested in it. Play to your strengths, you know, when you. It was just a bit jank for me, and yeah, when yeah. I found out Martin Clunes is in Doctor Who, I think like they love the Candyman, Chris. So good. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> Not shit oh, at no. all. <laughs> and we know, uh, you know, Neil Morrissey. I mean, what, what did Neil Morrissey, was he doing much before Men Behaving Badly? I don't really know his history Noel's house before. party. Oh, okay. Oh, God, Sammy the Shammy. He was Sammy the Shammy. He's Sammy the Shammy. <laughs> I think he was doing that at the same time, though. So it wasn't yeah. really like before he was famous. Yeah. Didn't Neil Morrissey yeah. do an Invisible Man show as well? Like Crime Traveller. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! Is that the biggest? You know, do you not remember Neil Morrissey's The Invisible Man, where he no. went invisible when he got in contact with water? Vaguely, no, no, this, is like this. At all. this is this is why my brain is so scary. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? That you always had those like C tier, like BBC One on a Saturday evening shows that were never yeah. like the big shows, like yeah, Bugs and yeah, that's the know. kind of shit I'm talking about. I'm They're sure Neil Morrissey like... did The Invisible Man. Vanishing Man for ITV. There you go. Was it the Vanishing Man? It must be. Yeah. Couldn't get the rights to Invisible Man. And if anyone, <laughs> if anyone has had the misfortune of watching the season of Crime Traveler, <laughs> oh dear God! <laughs> that, that, that's, we should just leave it there, really, shouldn't we? We shouldn't need to spend any more time on how, Crime Traveler. 
how sorry how would I ever it's just like they took a CBBC concept and made a straight drama with Chloe Annette oh. and David Wicks from fucking EastEnders. <laughs> it was so nasty. Like her her apartment was his big time machine. And it's like it's just shit stuck to the walls with flashy LEDs and spinning shit. <laughs> hey, do I need to watch this shit again? It's been so long. <laughs> I no, 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 so quite, vaguely they, remember it. it. And it, it tried doing the whole, you know, paradoxes and stuff. You can't bump into your, your other self and stuff like that. And you have to be back in this apartment at a certain time. And it never made sense logically because the apartment wouldn't have a time machine set up if you go back and alter the timeline. Oh, God. Oh, no. I believe Crime Traveler is all on YouTube. So if anyone wants to see the UK's TV at its worst. Mm. It's been, I guess the only other trouble with that is like each episode is like 45, 50 minutes long, isn't it? So, it's I, don't, like I don't know. I haven't watched it in... <laughs> and again, I think I found it by chance once. And I was like, what the fuck is this? It said Chloe Annette was in it. I was like, that's worth tuning in. Just see Chik- Chikans- Kachansky yeah. for a few hours. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, Not the uh, uh, series one Kachansky, that'd be a weird. But... No, a completely different actress. And that's Big weird. lady, <laughs> just like the the one last thing I want to talk about with Men Behaving Badly um, is just Leslie Ash, who played uh, Deborah in in the show, and um, it was quite sad, really, when uh, you know she got a bit older and she she did the whole Botox thing to her lips and yeah, came away of... looking like Macaulay Culkin from the end of bloody uh, <laughs> <laughs> My Girl, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, oh, it's, no. just another just another ev- evidence of like uh, you know girls you just don't need to do this just don't worry about it your lips are fine the way that they naturally are just just leave them alone because yeah. you know I have kind of a light crush now watching the show back in the day mm. and then there's a <laughs> same thing what happened to Meg Ryan as well isn't it? yeah she's so attractive and mm. then Mer- America's little sweetheart you don't like, what do did this. you do do it yeah, there's just 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 leave them alone. They're fine. Mm-hmm. They're fine. And I think the the only other thing as well that just remembering about men behaving badly is the way that they dealt with Tony towards the end of the show because they they, they I can't remember which series it starts from, but like I feel like Tony changes a little bit and he's a bit more annoying <laughs> if that if that's a good word. I don't know if you two agree, but he seems he seems a bit different to the way that Tony was when he first started the show. And I'm not talking like in a progressive way or anything like he's, he, his characteristics seem to change and like, he seems to be a bit more stupid as in what he, mm. I don't know. I never really thought about that to be honest. I don't know if, if, if you, uh, it seems like you two never really noticed that before, but it's something that I noticed when I was watching it and wished that they had, hadn't really done that with Tony's character. I don't know if it's just me. It feels like know. it's kind of. Um, I think I know what you mean. It just feels like doing the whole dumb thing with him. It feels a bit. It's hitting a bit broad. Like you know, you can make him more of a flesh out character than mm. just being a bit derp, 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 derp. Yeah, you know, it's getting into yeah. And like when when Deborah and Tony finally get together, and like. I don't know. Just like it was just really annoying. So Tony just bugged them, just leave, go away. Yeah, uh, I'll have more Gary, please, and less Tony. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I can see that. I can, I can understand that. Okay, cool. Well, the spe- the series did spawn an American version of the same name, Men Behaving Badly, which starred Rob Schneider and uh, Ron Eldard. The series premiered in the United States on the eighteenth of September, nineteen ninety seven, and ran for just two seasons. Two seasons is way too much. <laughs> Do you two... as the, uh, the Red Dwarf US version. Oh, God, was... yeah. seen, but I've not seen any of the US version. I, does that have the theme tune? I've never I've uh, not watched any I of it either. I believe so. Wow. That's I think the weird. only crossover was... So they had two American pilots for Red Dwarf. Are we Dwarf. talking about Red Dwarf? Well, I'm, talking, I'm talking about Mim Evan Bailey. I've seen Red Dwarf. <laughs> Um, yeah. I thought was, so. I I didn't realize they had made an American version of Men Behaving Badly. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Like, I, 
Hey, Robert Schneider, isn't it? Good God. <laughs> Rev Schneider is the doop doop. <laughs> Rev Schneider's carrot. The carrot. <laughs> oh no, the carrot. <laughs> <laughs> really PG 13. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God bless South Park, sorry. <laughs> I'm done. Uh, <laughs> I'm um, going to have to look that up now. <laughs> I had no idea that it even happened. Yeah, sorry, Chris. Bear of bad news. Um, and, and as we've mentioned, Harry Enfield was cast in the co-starring role of Dermot due to his popularity as, com- as a comedian in the mid-1980s. However, Enfield specialised in sketch comedy and voice acting. He had not been cast in a regular role in sitcom before and found it difficult to adjust to, his form- to this format. He resigned following the first season of the series. Well, that's it. We got through the TV shows of 1997. That's all the time we have for for this time. If you have enjoyed the podcast and would like to support us, then we do have a coffee page where you can give us a one-off tip or if you're feeling kinder, a monthly tip starting from a pound. Massive thank you to all who have done so. You're all legends. And if that is not right for you right now, you can also support us by giving us a review or rating on Apple or Spotify or Podchaser. You can find the links in the show notes. As mentioned at the beginning of the show, we now have a Discord server to chat all things retro and modern day, and it has been fun chatting with everyone in there and sharing our top fives, which at the time of recording is our top five 90s movie actors and actresses. And uh, some interesting top fives have been shared there. It's also the place to put your opinions on the stuff we cover on the podcast, which will get mentioned on the on the show so why not come and join us we would love to say hello you can find the invite link in the show notes of this podcast or on our website speaking of the website you can also find links to our coffee page our entire back catalog of episodes and much more on our website at the wolfypod.com thank you next time (laughs) next time we warm up to the video games of 1997 by chatting to a special guest with a very cool connection to the world of the video game goldeneye look out for that in a couple of weeks time chaps it's time to say goodbye goodbye farewell my name is big jason dom it's over to you well that's it for another episode of what's wrong with wolfie the boys are off now to hit the roulette table with patricia routledge see you later What's wrong with Wolfie? I can hear him barking.